morning. We thank God for another privilege to come in his presence to worship. I'd like to read from the Gospel of John, the 15th chapter, the words of Jesus as he was marching to the cross. He says to his disciples, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. But without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my word, uh, words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we just thank you, Lord, for these wonderful words of our Savior, these words of admonition, these words of commandment. Oh Lord, for we know that there's life and there's power in his word. So Lord, this morning the church, oh Lord, is bound again before you, oh Lord. And Lord, we ask you to search us, search our hearts, Lord. See if any wicked way in us, oh Lord, and lead us in the path everlasting. But Lord, we want to abide in Jesus. We want Jesus to abide in us, oh Lord. So, oh Lord, we pray, oh Lord, each and every day that we live, that we'll be conscious, that we'll be mindful of his presence. Oh Lord, we want to go about bearing the, the fruit, good fruits, oh Lord, of righteousness in this world. Lord, there's many, many Oh Lord, that are away from the awful Satan. Those in our, some even in our household, oh Lord, may, be, may not be letting Christ come in. There are those in our community, oh Lord, that are walking contrary to you, oh Lord. There are many, oh Lord, with their minds on everything uh, that is in this life. Not considering that this life, O oh Lord, is passing away. That you, O oh Lord, is coming back again. So Lord, as we linger here today with one another around your word, listening again to the message that you have for us, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would continue to strengthen our heart and our mind. Bless our families, O oh Lord. Give them peace, O oh Lord, that passes all understanding as they lean on you, O oh Lord. But we know, O oh Lord, that you, you have what we need, and that you will, O oh Lord, supply. So bless us, Lord, today, and help us, O oh Lord, to go from this place, O oh Lord, continuing to serve you, O oh Lord, continuing to bear the good fruit. In Jesus' name we pray.
Good morning to my Mount Zion family and friends. Here we are again on the first Sunday of the last month of 2021. God has been, still is good to us. This time we come to protect our Lord's body in remembrance of what he has done for us. Our scripture this morning will come from the book of Mark, chapter 14, verses 12 through 21. The New Living Translation read, On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go to prepare the Passover meal for you? So Jesus sent two of them into Jerusalem with these instructions. As you go into the city, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. So the two disciples went into the city and followed everything just as Jesus had said. And they prepared the Passover meal there. In the evening, Jesus arrived with the twelve. As they were at the table eating, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, one of you eating with me here will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one asked in turn, am I the one? He replied, is the one of you twelve who is eating from this bowl with me? But the Son of Man must die as the scripture declared long ago. But how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It will be far better for that man if he had never been born. As we prepare to participate in the ordinance of communion, scripture declares, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. But preparation is not an option for the believers. For the scripture declared, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. The bread and the blood represent what he did. Communion is a powerful thing to remember and acknowledge our wonderful Savior and Lord. This wine is to be taken reverently. This bread is to be eaten with respect. Thank you that through communion we can express our relationship with you. We now have eternal life through you. All that Jesus did for us was more than enough that we might spend eternity with you. Through Jesus' great sacrifice, we are now in complete fellowship with you, and we are free and thankful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, and amen. For I have received from the Lord that which I deliver to you, that Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed to bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, as we take this bread, we remember that you are the bread of life. You feed our souls, you nourish our hearts, and you give us substance to run the race before us. As we break the bread, we feel the softness of your love for us. Let us eat together. In the same manner, 
He also took the cup out of supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he come. Lord, as we drink from the cup, we remember that you are the giver of life. You are forgiveness. You bring deep peace to our soul, and your love flows within us. From this cup, we see your sacrifice poured out for us. We notice the depth of your goodness and the pain you suffered for us and the price you paid to set us free. In fact, we can say that under the old agreement, also everything was cleansed by the sprinkling it with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Let us drink together. After our Lord and his disciples ate the bread and drank from the cup, celebrating the supper of our Lord, it is said they sang a hymn and went out, lead us into a selection. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting in my soul. Bread from heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up, and make me whole. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord, come and quench. This thirsting in my soul, bread from heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up, and make me.
translation reads on this wise. On the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowd, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. But the scripture declares, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. When he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. Thus in the reading of God's holy word. We want to talk to you this day from this subject. Lord Filled me up. Lord, fill me up. Just for a little background, chapter 7 opens with Jesus in Galilee. For he would not walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now, the Jewish feast of tabernacles, booths, were approaching. 
His brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples there may also see the works that you do. No one does anything in secret when he wants to be known popular, uh, publicly. If you must do these things, show yourself openly to the world and make yourself known. For not even his brothers believed in him. But Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but any time is right for you. The world cannot hate you since you are part of it. But it does hate me because I denounce it and testify that its deeds are, are evil. Jesus said to his brothers, Go to the feast yourselves. I am not going because my time has not yet fully come. Having said these things, he stayed in Galilee. But afterwards, when his brothers had gone to the feast, he went, not publicly, but quietly, because he did not want to be noticed. The Jews kept looking for him and asking, where is he? There was a lot of whistling discussion and murmuring among the crowds about him. Some were saying, he is a good man. Others said, no, on the, on the contrary, he misleads the people, giving them false ideas. No one was speaking out openly and freely about him for the fear of the leaders of the Jews. When the feast was already half over, Jesus went into the temple court and began to teach the Jews were perplexed. They said, How did this man become learned in the scripture and theology without form training? Jesus answered, saying, My teacher is not my own, but him who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know whether the teaching is of God or whether I speak of my own accord and my own authority. He who speaks on his own accord speaks glory and honor for himself. But he who seeks the glory and honor of the one who sent him, he is true and there is no unrighteousness or deception in him. Listen to the, this question from Jesus. Did not Moses give you the law? And yet no one of you keeps the law. Why do you want to kill me for not keeping it? The crowd answered, you have a demon. You are out of your mind. Who wants to kill you? Jesus replied, I did one work and you are astonished. Moses had given you God's law regarding circumcision, not that it originated from Moses, but from the patriarchs, and you criticized a man even on the Sabbath. To avoid breaking the law of Moses, a man undergoes circumcision on the Sabbath. Why are you angry with me for making a man whole body well on the Sabbath. Do not judge by appearance superficially and arrogantly, but judge fairly and righteously. Some of the people said, is this not the man they want to kill? He speaks publicly. Is it possible that the rulers only know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man is from. Whether the Christ come, no one will know where he's from. Jesus called out, you know me and know where I am from. And I have not come to my own, on my own initiative, a self-appointment, 
But he who sent me is true, and him you do not know. I know him myself because I am from him. I came from his very presence, and it was he personally who sent me. This they were anger or ego to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his time has not yet come. But many from the crowd believed him. All week long, the huge crowd of people who had come to Jerusalem from all over Israel and even from other land were camping out in booths or shelters made of tree bark and branches. It was a festival time. For they were celebrating the Feast of the Tabernacle, which was a reminder of Israel's 40 years in the wilderness. It was also a harvest celebration, rejoicing in the gathering crops of another season, something like our Thanksgiving. One of the spiritual purposes of this feast was to bring back to their remembrance the journey their ancestors made from Egypt into the land of divine promise. On the last day of the feast, their mind were to recall how that God supplied water, life-giving water, for their ancestors out of a rock as they journeyed in the wilderness hundreds of years ago. God never wants us to forget the things he has done for us in the past. Being thankful for the past helps us to receive from God our needs for today. The text, the Amplified Bible read, now on the last and most important day of the feast, Jesus stood and called out in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, who adhere to and trust in and rely on me, as the scripture has said, from his innermost being will flow continuous rivers of living water. But he was speaking of the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him as Savior were to receive afterward. The Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified, raised to honor. For seven days, a priest had gone each day with a pitcher of gold to the pool of Siloam to get a pitcher full of water, which was then brought back and poured out at the base of the altar in remembrance of the miraculous provision of water in the wilderness. This act of worship was a type and shadow of the divine water that flows from having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, there is not only life offered, but he offers rivers of water. Rivers refers to its non-stopping abundance. For it was Jesus who declared, I have come that you may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. John 10, 10. Oh, how I wish people could come to the understanding that coming to Jesus does not take from us, but rather it enriches our lives. While in the grave, Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave, and took the keys of life everlasting, free and abundance, and gave those spiritual keys to his children. Jesus does not make our life miserable. The only real joy of life comes from walking with him in pure fellowship, our relationship. For several days, Jesus had been teaching in the temple courts. 
Verse 37 says, Now in the last and most important day of the feast, Jesus stood and called out in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. 38, He who believes in me, who will hear to, trust in, and rely on me, as the scripture says, for his innermost being will flow continuous rivers of living water. For seven days, the water had been poured out at the altar to symbolize God as satisfying the physical thirst of his people. Now Jesus picked up this objective lesson and said in effect, now if you really want to satisfy your thirst, come to me. There are many things which people thirst for. They thirst for affection, happiness, money, popularity, many things. But the real basis of this thirst is spiritual in nature. When you feel uneasy, sad, lacking peace of heart, beware that this is a spiritual problem and you need to seek help. That help comes from the Lord. It has been said that the heart is restless till it finds its rest in the Lord. The satisfaction of spiritual emptiness of the human heart can only be satisfied by a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only one who can provide for forgiveness of sin which haunt us. Jesus is the only one who can provide a living relationship with God. Jesus is the only one who can give us eternal life and set us free from the fear of death. Come to me, Jesus said, and I will satisfy your deepest need. In fact, Jesus said, come to me, and I will give you rest. All you who work so hard beneath a heavy yoke, wear my yoke, for it fits perfectly. And let me teach you for I am gentle and humble, and you will find rest for your soul. For I give you only light burdens. Matthew 11, 28. Can I tell you, if you really want to be deeply satisfied, adhere to Jesus' words. Come to me and allow Jesus to fill you and use you. I declare that you will find that you are richly blessed. When you trust Jesus Christ as your own Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your life to fill you with his grace and mercy and goodness. David was so sure of that that he declared, surely goodness and mercy and unfailing love follow me all the days of my life. Psalms 23, uh, 6. During this feast, there were special rituals that Jesus used to reveal how he was the fulfillment of what they were celebrating. The priest would draw water from the pool of Siloam and carry the water to the temple. At the temple, the priest would pour the water into a large basin, and in another basin, they poured wine. The water and wine represent the Holy Spirit in God's Word. At a certain time, the priest will raise the basin and pour out the water and wine, which will run down the steps of the temple, which looked like a raging river. To the Hebrews, it symbolized the water that flows from the rock in the wilderness. But Jesus knew that it meant more. It pointed to the time when rivers of living water and new wine will be poured out on God's people. 
Little did they know the rock that had given their fathers water to drink had now come in the flesh to give them rivers of living water. Paul writes, and all of them drank the same spiritual water, for they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4. Like the priest that poured out the wine and water, Jesus came to be our baptizer in the, the Holy Spirit. Just a few chapters earlier, chapter 4, Jesus had mentioned this living water to a Samaritan woman. It was similar, but it was, it, it was also satisfying her thirst. But it was different for what she was promised, but not the rivers, but a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. John 4, 14. But here in the seventh chapter of John, John clears up the difference in the two. The bubbling spring that Jesus Christ was talking about was the Holy Spirit's work in salvation like a interbubbling spring of sanctification. But in Jesus' declaration at the feast, John made it clear that he was referring to the baptism of the Holy Spirit that becomes rivers that cannot be held back. The fact that Jesus used rivers as a symbol for the spirit filling life, it signifies cons consistency and continuing on. For he was looking at the fact that Jesus had carved out the Amazon, Jesus had directed the Nile, Jesus had put the might in that Mississippi. And Jesus chose rivers to describe the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Note it was plural rivers. Started as a bubbling spring, but it became rivers mightier than our natural rivers because it channeled the life water, living water. Being a river, bring a river to the desert, and it produces an oasis. The Amazon basin, with its miles of river, holds more species of plants and animals and produces more of our oxygen than any other place in the world. An abundance of rivers mean an abundance of life. Life is not just produced in us, but pure life, living water, flows through us. This life is not diluted or partially, but 100% life flowing from the resurrection and the life, which is Jesus Christ. For we know that Jesus Christ is resurrection and life. From our study of John chapter 11, Beginning at verse 17, we read that when Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many other people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. When Martha gets the word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. 
Everyone who lives and believes in me will never even die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who comes into the world from God. John 11, 17 through 27. You cannot be more alive than when the Spirit is flowing, is freely flowing through you. But be warned, you can quit a dabbing up the free flowing of the Holy Spirit with bitterness, with discouragement, with doubt, with fear, with sin, with unforgiveness. Whenever the river flows, it produces life. Let the living water touch those dry, dead areas of your inner self. We are a walking oasis in a world that is a desert wasteland filled with lifeless men. Let the rivers flow. Let it revive those that work and live around you. As you get the spirit flowing through you, it will bring you into fellowship with other spirit-filled believers. Life draws life and rejoices in its company. Fellowship is not fighting. But its very nature, rivers undergo constant change. If you are willing to be a channel of the Holy Spirit, you too must be willing to undergo something relevant sometimes radical change in your life and be willing to live your life in flux of transforming power. Rivers are cleaner than lakes and ponds because they clean themselves. The work of the Holy Spirit is a constant satisfaction of what is needed in our life. There is garbage in all of our lives that we'll never, we never get rid of from life until we let them go into the cleansing flow. It is easy in the power current of the Holy Spirit. It just takes letting go. A river makes its own channel, sometimes cutting through solid rock to get where it is going and often take the most unexpected turns. When we get comfortable doing what we are doing, headed where we are headed, the Holy Spirit will often bring, begin to cut a path in our area where has not been through. The first move of the flow of the river is not to widen, but to cut deeper. The Holy Spirit will cut below your shallow confession and your superficial service until he produces depth in your life. This cutting can sometimes be painful and humbling in what it reveals about you below the surface. The Holy Spirit is not just a reviving spirit, it is an evangelistic spirit. Rivers are different from lakes because rivers constantly push outward until they reach the sea. The baptism of the Holy Spirit will not just warm you, it will drive you. Many have felt the target of the Holy Spirit but have resisted and made excuses. You need to unite your life from all the things that keep you where you are and get in the current flow of the Spirit of the living God. The Holy Spirit gives you the authority to lift, to be lifted from your depression, lifted from feeling of hopelessness, and lifted from sorrow. Paul prayed, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. 
then you will overflow with comfort and hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 15, 13. Pray for yourself and others to be lifted from any feeling of sadness through the power, hope, love, and joy of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, as Lord, gives great authority to those who are involved and in completing his great commission. Jesus said, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the command I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus also said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaritan, and to the ends of the earth. Acts 1 and verse 8. Ask the Lord to help you appropriate the power given to you for the filling of the Lord's purpose to enlarge his kingdom and righteousness. The Holy Spirit gives you great energy, creativity, and fruitfulness as you grow in faith. Verse 38, Jesus said, He who believes in me who adheres to, trust in, and rely on me, as the scriptures have said, for his innermost being will flow continuous rivers of living water. Allow the Lord to give you greater energy, creativity, and the fruitlessness as you grow up in all aspect into him. The Holy Spirit gives you the ability to bring healing to people's spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. Some people are unable or unwilling to receive Christ's forgiveness because they do not understand how forgiveness is possible. They are unknowing of the purpose of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross as a substitute for their sins. Other people have never had anyone point out that their pride is hindering them from humbling themselves before God to ask them for forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Still others are blocked, blocked them from from receiving Jesus' forgiveness because they refuse to forgive those who have sinned against them. People need to learn to forgive immediately and continuously until they appropriate the completeness of Christ's forgiveness. Ask the Lord, ask the Lord to allow you to bring healing to people through the ministry of offering the benefit of forgiveness found in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit gives us the authority to be delivered from all our problems. Paul said, I know how to live on almost nothing or without everything. I learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me the strength. Philippians 4, 12 and verse 13. If you, if we are obedient, then rivers of water will flow forth from our bellies, our intermost part. Ask the Lord for great confidence 
in his authoritative promise, power and presence. That is to say, Lord, fill me up with your Holy Spirit. A certain writer said, we are all gathered here in your presence, Lord, with our arms open wide. We lift hands with lifted hands and with open heart. We welcome you to abide. Oh Lord, we need your spirit, your Holy Spirit right now. Oh Lord, give us your spirit, your Holy Spirit right now. But we can do nothing until you come, dear Lord. For we are so unworthy to even call on your name. So please, 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 Lord, hear our prayer. And do not let our coming be in vain. Spirit, spirit, fall fresh on me. Fall down fall down, fall fresh on me. Spirit, spirit of the living God, I cannot make it without you. I need you so I can walk right, so I can talk right. Holy Spirit, fall fresh on me. I need you to abide in me, in everything I do, in everything I say. Lord, I need you in my home. And even when I am riding down the dangerous highways, I need you. I need you, Lord, every day. I cannot make it without you, Lord. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. I do not want my running to be in vain. I do not want my living to be in vain. I need you, Lord, to lead me. Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. As we close today, we want to say, Lord, fill me up. I need your Spirit in every walk of life. I need to feel the power of the river flowing through me. I need you to walk with me. I need you to talk with me. I need you to remind me that I am not your child. I thank you for Jesus Christ. Him that came to live in this world and to die on a cross called Calvary. But then he arose on the first day of the week declaring that all power was in his hand. Then he said to the disciples one day, he breathed on them and said, receive you the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for filling us with your spirit that we may be able to walk in this world knowing that you are by our side. Lord, fill me up every day. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. There may be someone today who need a filling of the Spirit of God. All you have to do is ask Him and He will pour out His Spirit upon you. If you're not a church owner, we invite you to come. You can come by letter, Christian experience, or a candidate for baptism. All you have to your will to Him and let Jesus in your life. And I declare he will fill the you up. Not him is able to keep you from falling. It was that you fall before his prayer to see the joy. To know why God was our Savior, to the very night power, and the saints of God you said, in my home. Amen. Amen. And, and even when I'm riding down the dangerous highways, yes. 